I'm Patty Brennan, Director of the National Library of Medicine. Thanks very much for joining us for this lecture, Science, Technology, and Society, that is sponsored by the NLM's Office of Strategic Initiatives. This lecture aims to raise awareness around the societal, excuse me, societal and ethical implications in the conduct of biomedical research and in the technologies, while seeding conversations across the library, the NIH, and the broader biomedical research community. We're extremely pleased to welcome Dr. Sophia U. Noble, a leading scholar in internet studies and a professor of gender studies and African-American studies, as well as co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. In 2021, Dr. Noble was recognized as a MacArthur Foundation Fellow for her groundbreaking work on algorithmic discrimination or the way in which algorithms produce systematic and repeatable results that create or reinforce unjust or prejudicial outcomes. This work prompted her founding of a nonprofit equity engine to accelerate investment in companies, education, and networks driven by women of color. She also lent her expertise as a research associate at the Oxford Institute, in Oxford Internet Institute, where she is a commissioner on the Oxford Commission on AI and Good Governance. Her lecture, Taking on Big Tech, New Paradigms for New Possibilities, will help us think through the ways in which technologies are not neutral and reflect the biases that exist within our broader society. When these biases go unchecked or uninterrogated, they can become baked into the algorithms that serve up information that is central to how we make decisions and see the world. I'm eager to hear her insights as to how we may reverse these trends, particularly given our responsibility as the world's largest biomedical library and a leader in data science research. The lecture will be followed by a Q&A. So if you have questions for Dr. Noble, please make use of the live feedback button to submit your questions. You will find this just below the, the, the talk description, excuse me. Um, there is also a link on your screen for the ALS, American Sign Language Interpretation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Noble. And Dr. Noble, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful invitation. I'm truly thrilled to be here with you today. I um, have to say that, um, you know, I consider it such an honor to get to speak before librarians. My um, home community, if you will, my scholarly community is among library and information science professionals. And so, um, it's, a, it's just a great opportunity to share a little bit about my work with you today, but then also one of the things I'd like to do in this talk is expose you to other people who are now working in this field and um, who I think would be tremendous resource for you as well. Um, what I'm gonna ask in return is that you, um, as I talk about my work and share other people's um, brilliance with you, that you be thinking about ways that you might be able to partner with us or um, recommend these scholars and their work because uh, there's still so much to do. It seems like um, every day we're reading a new headline about uh, harms that are coming to various publics, but in particular vulnerable people around the world. And um, for as many people as are as, as many people are coming into the field of study at the kind of intersection of, of society and technology, um, we cannot even begin to keep up with the incredible amount of work there is to do. So I'm going to try to enlist your help, those of you who are um, watching today, to also um, think about how you can participate in stemming the tide around some of the kinds of dangers that we are seeing as researchers. So um, let me just say a word here about this um, photograph. You know, this photograph is really inspired by um, the provocation that we think about the effects or what it means to um, go digital and to have everything be um, uh, digitally networked and, and the way in which we think about knowledge and information sharing being um, so, so deeply and profoundly tied to electronics. 
a couple of years ago, about three years ago, I spent the summer in Accra, Ghana, really looking at and thinking about the global implications of the way in which we talk about um, networked knowledge and networked information uh, made available vis-a-vis -vis computers and computing technology. And, you know, yet we don't think about, particularly in the kind of global north or in the west, we don't think about um, who pays the price or the kind of global supply chain, whether it's the kind of extraction industries of mining that are so incredibly necessary in order to make microprocessor chips and other kinds of resources that are needed um, for computing, or whether it's kind of at the end of the life cycle of electronics, when we make, um, you know, uh, billions of pounds of uh, e-waste, electronic waste, discarded electronics. So I think those are things to be thinking about, just the, the material dimensions of what it means to become um, so profoundly invested in the digital. And those are the kinds of things that I look at as well in my research. So um, with that, I will um, uh, offer up that there are um, many ways that we could be thinking about the long-term viability of knowledge. And certainly that is what brought me to these inquiries um, myself. All right. Um, can you see that, can someone give me a thumbs up, maybe Patty um, or Miriam, uh, Mike, that you can see this next slide. Great, thank you. Um, so there are a number of theorists who've really been proposing important interventions at the intersection of race, technology, and society. And I want to just foreground these people because some of them came before, uh, I'll just say I stand on their shoulders, you know, they were doing important work that really um, disrupted the way that we think about vulnerable communities, um, communities of color. And of course, my work is always centered on vulnerable people because I think that uh, there are many communities who are, uh, let's say technology is beta tested upon them, who have very little uh, ability or recourse to speak back to the ways in which they are either misrepresented or uh, directly outright harmed by different kinds of technologies. And I want you to be thinking about this in the context of um, librarianship and uh, data curation and data management, because even inside our systems, um, we often do not think about the way in which people are represented or people are misrepresented or the ways in which um, we are deploying frames toward different kinds of communities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, these are scholars who also have been looking at a variety of different kinds of uh, technological histories and futures that I um, can't recommend enough. If you're interested in reading more and learning more, I strongly recommend the Critical Race and Digital Studies syllabus. Uh, we, th those of us who are on the screen here, um, and many, many others who, whom I can't fit them all on one slide, uh, have been doing work for since kind of the early uh, years of the internet and all the way through to the kind of the contemporary and future casting. And so um, this is definitely a, a very powerful and important resource for you and for um, colleagues and students that you may interact with. Um, let me just say that I, you know, the, the kind of one of the marquee, let's say, uh, dimensions of my work has been the book Algorithms of Oppression, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But really this work that I've been thinking about in terms of the harms of different kinds of digital technology platforms and media companies, digital media companies against Black communities has kind of been ongoing. It's actually even surprising uh, to me that the last 10 years has really flown by, 10, 11 years. Um, and I, I point to this because I think uh, our work, those of us who have been trying to sound the alarm that there are different kinds of uh, material and representational harms that come through different types of digital technologies, including in the library, um, that work has been quite obscure. I think um, it's really only been the last couple of years that the idea that maybe 
digital technologies or everything the internet has promised us isn't um, isn't quite the liberatory force that we thought it would be. Or maybe there are some consequences to these types of investments. And we're talking about trillions of dollars of investments globally. Um, and we're just now getting to the moment where we can uh, have more visibility around these conversations and the interventions, quite frankly, that we need so desperately to slow down the rapid rush to uncritical deployment of different kinds of technologies. And I see this most um, acutely as a professor at UCLA with students who, for example, have a, 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 their relationship to the library and this is my undergraduate students, is, is mostly around going and finding study space or places to sleep and not really having the kind of facility and the stamina to engage with librarians and, and our many libraries on our campus um, and th because they have been socialized around things like internet search uh, and that becomes kind of the, the default way in which they have come to think about accessing information and knowledge. And of course, um, I find that to be so incredibly dangerous um, on a number, for a number of reasons. Uh, and so I want to talk about, um, and I want you to think with me today in this conversation about um, what, what it means when large digital technology companies are shaping and remaking expectations about how to access knowledge and information too, um, such that uh, many people believe that everything can be known and it can be known in 0 0.03 seconds in their searching and, uh, and really do not um, necessarily have the kind of careful eye toward um, deeper investigation. Um, that also is socializing researchers and people who come into contact with um, libraries and librarianship. Um, uh, I often hear people talking about how, you know, how difficult it is to navigate research communities, research um, uh, 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 kind of go, going deep into research. And um, so we are all kind of socialized by this new phenomena of internet search. And so that's one of the things I want to talk about now. Um, when I was writing this book, Algorithms of Oppression, I was thinking about the future of knowledge. I was at the um, information school at the Graduate School of Library and Information Science, um, its former name, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And um, at the time, Google was really coming into vogue, as were search engines really um, uh, more broadly. Many of us I know on this uh, call were on the internet long before search engines. Um, we, we remember old uh, directories of information, many of them curated and managed by librarians around the world, um, uh, DIYers, subject matter experts of varying uh, types. Um, people understood kind of the, let's say the um, precarious and fragile, if, in, if, if anything, um, ways of exploring the internet. I try to uh, tell my students that, you know, we used to have, um, I don't have one here with me, but, you know, we used to have these books, phone books, if you will, of URLs. I know some of you on this call know what I'm talking about. and remember that those days. And um, we, in, in many ways, I think we're relieved when uh, um, search engines came about because they did some of the hard work, you know, of indexing what was available on the web and then kind of displaying results for us and in uh, what felt like, let's say, maybe less complicated and cumbersome ways. Um, certainly, uh, the opacity of what was happening behind the uh, the interface, if you will, uh, that would create or generate those displays was quite different than our own previous labor of looking through and searching through directories ourselves. So this is one of the things that I think is so important. And I've seen many academic libraries um, try to model their own search functionalities uh, around what search engines, uh, commercial search engines did for the internet. And 
I think this is one of the places where we should stop and really spend some time thinking about the, the implications of that. First of all, we know that there's something about this kind of, um, uh, you know, opaque interface that with just the simplicity um, or the alleged simplicity of a search box where people enter terms. Many times we know, for example, from the information retrieval literature that uh, um, people search with very few words, uh, I guess, unless you're a computer programmer. I know lots of prog programmers who might put in a string of code to uh, look for mistakes or breaks in the code. But um, for the most part, people use very few keywords that they enter into these kind of opaque systems. And um, then they believe that what they get back is, in fact, the most kind of credible and um, uh, viable information. Excuse me, I'm fighting a bit of a cold today. Um, so this book, this kind of investigation that I started in 2010, 2011, and completed in 2016, which came out in 2018, was a look at the kinds of searches that um, um, I had con collected and done over several years uh, on um, women and girls of color on a variety of different kinds of occupations. And then there were stories or case studies of um, people and um, uh, ideas that had proliferated in search engines that had, were that had even caused viral news stories. And what the implications of it um, were, what does it mean when we become reliant upon searching databases or um, searching uh, an index of the web and relating to it as if it's true, um, credible. And of course, what are the cultural implications of um, the work that librarians do in um, creating metadata about the kinds of things that we find in the library and online? Um, and um, what are the incredible responsibilities that we have with respect to that when we are doing that in, um, for the most part, uh, in the case of something like Google, um, you don't have librarians necessarily working uh, on search algorithms there um, who are not thinking, this is people who are not thinking about the subjective nature of knowledge and information, uh, the veracity, the credibility, what should be seen, what should be known. And these are the kinds of things that um, that I investigated for several years. So you have, um, for example, um, from 2009 to 2012, I was conducting searches on the keywords Black girls. And this, of course, was true for um, these types of results. If you can see them here, um, most of these are porn pornographic um, websites. These are websites that are either one click away or directly connected to you. Uh, pornographic websites. And I was asking the question in the book, what does it mean that you don't have to act, add um, descriptors like sex or porn, but that girls of color in the United States, for the most part, um, Black girls, Latina girls, Asian girls, were synonymous with pornography. And of course, um, I've been writing about this and talking about this for a decade. Um, we have seen some improvements with the images and the websites that come to the fore around Black girls. Um, we still have work to do around other girls of color and women of color in the United States. And so um, the, this really opened up to me a, a very important conversation that we've been having uh, since this book came out and, and articles prior to this about the incredibly subjective nature of search and the way in which those companies and industries with the most money are able to really control the narratives and the kinds of resources um, that come to the fore. And um, uh, companies uh, in the kind of gray market of SEO are also able to uh, deeply manipulate the kinds of things and gamify search algorithms. Um, and of course, there is some uh, effect from what 
uh, the public is searching for and what the public is clicking on. But I would argue that even um, for those who feel that the kinds of results that we get on the first page of search are purely connected to what the public is searching for, then we have to ask ourselves about the profoundly kind of undemocratic way in which that happens because Black girls themselves are in such a small percentage in the uh, population that we would never be able to control the narratives about Black women and girls that uh, are arrived at if we're just talking about kind of a majority rules type of um, engagement. So this book is really about kind of exploding a number of different myths that people hold about how search engines work and really trying to unpack for as, as, as close a, a glimpse as we can get uh, without kind of knowing what uh, these proprietary algorithms are in commercial search spaces. Um, but it's also about thinking about what, um, what does it mean for us to try to, in the um, library information space, um, try to model our own projects after commercial search engines. And I think there's a lot of um, tension um, here in that space that we should be continuing to investigate. I will make this even more specific, of course, in the context of health and medicine, one of the things we know, for example, is that um, the most searched keywords and terms um, in Google search are related to health. And so um, we need to ask ourselves about the um, way in which publics are profoundly reliant upon search technologies to help them navigate um, whether it's their own medical advice and health information and things that they're uh, exposed to or that are recommended to them by healthcare professionals, but also the way in which they are targeted through social media um, with different kinds of uh, uh, fraudulent, uh, you know, not scientific, not uh, proven um, health remedies, remedies, if you will. Uh, we saw this uh, of course, I'm preaching to the choir here in terms of COVID-19, but also um, around vaccinations prior to that and other kinds of um, medical inquiry that the public has. And for me, I ask these questions in relationship to not only like what are the words that are searched and how is it that the public cannot access scientific research for the most part, because much of that kind of research is sequestered away into uh, library databases that are not available to the public. They're often in academic libraries where you need to have some type of access or relationship to the university in order to access that kind of information. Um, and so these are the kinds of tensions that I think in this moment in particular, when uh, uh, in the US, we have so um, such a precarious and fragile national healthcare system that we uh, the public is left with nothing but advertising engines to help them navigate um, these incredible complex um, information needs. All right, so those are the, some things that I think are worth thinking about. I will say that in many times when I'm speaking with librarians, I really try to encourage our community to think about what we can do and how we can partner with each other. We have such a long history of strategic partnerships and building on behalf of the public, <coughs> excuse me, in so many different uh, ways. Um, how might we be thinking about indexing the web and making um, scientific information more visible, readily available to the public? rather than um, their whole reliance upon commercial advertising um, spaces. Now, you know, one of the things we know is that these kinds of, um, you know, grotesque misrepresentations of Black women and girls, these are not just uh, happening in the kind of new media environment of the internet. These are old ideas and old stereotypes, racist and sexist tropes that have been with us for, um, you know, really since the a beginning of the uh, Americas or the kind of, uh, you know, early colonial period, um, uh, you know, these mythologies had to accompany these mythologies, for example, that Black women are more sexual. Um, 
had to be invented and uh, uh, produced and circulated to justify the enslavement and the reproduction of the enslaved labor force, uh, which Black women were forced to do, particularly after the, uh, uh, the transatlantic slave trade was made illegal. Uh, the only way in which enslaved people could uh, remain enslaved was through forced reproduction. And so we have um, uh, many artifacts here. You can see some of these artifacts. And if you're interested in these histories, I really encourage you to go to the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia that, uh, at Ferris University. That really helps us understand the history of racist stereotyping. Um, but what's so important about this is that um, these kinds of legacy uh, 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 racial, racial, uh, racially biased ideas, uh, discriminatory ideas are um, also profoundly and deeply embedded in libraries. Uh, and of course, we want to understand that as we're thinking about how the history of science, the history of medicine is also a history of not just experimentation, but of, of, uh, classifying Black people, Indigenous people, people of color, Jewish people as um, subhuman, right? It is, it, there's this profound kind of high power hierarchies that we live under still that are tied to these early histories and contemporary histories of science and medicine. And here I would point you to the work of people like Dorothy Roberts, Alondra Nelson, Ruha Benjamin, Terrence Keel, um, who have really helped us understand these histories. If you don't understand these histories or this is new information to you, I can't um, underscore enough how important it is to understand these histories as they affect and are affecting the future of science and medicine. And um, I'm certainly thinking about how they're affecting the future of digital technologies, for example, even the underlying logics that we have about hierarchical systems are tied to these early uh, uh, scientific classification projects. And of course, we know that librarianship is also the science of classification, the classification of knowledge and information, who is uh, foregrounded in the hierarchy of these knowledge systems. Those are the kinds of things we really want to understand and know and care about more deeply. Um, I would just say that um, the contribution that the, those of us who are working in this area, certainly in my work has been is to really think about um, uh, the ways in which the algorithms that we use in these digital systems are also uh, um, laden with a, a variety of different kinds of racial and um, gender uh, discriminatory logics. Um, when I was writing the book and working on uh, this research a decade ago, more than a decade ago, when I would argue that the algorithms and the artificial intelligence that's used to help, help sort through and index the web, um, that it, what it was encoded in racially biased ways, this was um, heretical. I mean, it was it's shocking to me that now, 10 years later, it's common sense, it's common knowledge that artificial intelligence and algorithms can be discriminatory, can be racist or sexist. But at the time that I was arguing it, um, people were not arguing that. And so we've done a lot of work and a lot of people have joined into this conversation. And we now have kind of an emergent field of critical race and digital studies, of critical internet studies, um, you know, we're, um, so much more deeply tied to ethnic studies. Um, and I've really helped uh, generate this community and be a part of this community because I think that um, with, with respect to the, uh, the catapulting, like the, the just the, the leap, the kind of blind faith that we have in so many different types of software, so many different types of database driven, um, uh, projects that are being invested in. There's just not enough time that's being taken to understand what these technologies are and how they will remake our future. Um, and so these are things that, um, uh, and you can see here other important books, Automating Inequality, looking at the way in which artificial intelligence has completely changed the social welfare system, foster care, um, Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology, um, uh, data feminisms, um, uh, 
um, design justice. I mean, these are all works that are so important to helping us understand how and where we can intervene. Um, I'll just say that um, other dimensions of this work for, for me have been scattered into other books and book chapters and um, that I've been working on with my students and my colleagues over the last decade. And these are also, I think, places where you can find more people thinking critically about uh, digital technology and, um, and uh, social harm. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to also um, you know, kind of consider is that um, we are living right now in a moment where people are um, very, like, let's say, uh, when I say people, I mean middle-class uh, Americans uh, are increasingly aware of the harms of social media. I sit as a member of the Real Facebook Oversight Board, which is really the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the community of journalists and scholars and critics of, um, of Facebook and its lack of um, investigation into its own contributions to uh, undermining democracy around the world, its, its role in uh, genocide and human rights violations and civil rights violations. And um, of course, uh, many journalists writing about the harms of social media, Facebook in particular. But one of the things that I think is just so important is that we remember that, that there's this really important relationship between um, social media and search. So here, if you go back to um, 2016, during the presidential election, um, when you did, <coughs> excuse me, a search on um, final election results, Google even gave us um, in, as a top hit, a website that took you to a disinformation site that, um, that showed uh, kind of inaccurate, completely false information about um, Donald Trump winning the popular vote. Now we know that he won the electoral college and that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but you have to ask yourself, what does it mean when um, hundreds of millions of people use a search engine to fact check things that they either hear in broadcast or mass media or that they come across in social media? And that then when they go to the commercial advertising systems that are search engines and they look to use them like fact checkers, and they find propaganda or disinformation. And to me, these are the kinds of things that are incredibly threatening uh, here to democracy and that we should be paying very close attention to um, in addition to not just politics, but the way in which people come to understand a whole host of issues around um, society, health, well-being, uh, and our collective kind of social welfare. Um, I want to just sh pause here for a moment, and I want to point you now to some other um, efforts that I think are really important. One of the things that we need so desperately in order to support the community of librarians and um, agencies that are um, funding work in the public interest is we really need to, the, the more support for research around these important conversations. Um, these are some that I think are really important or that I have been connected to. Obviously, our own center at the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, which I'll speak about in just a moment. Um, but you know, uh, the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, the Algorithmic Justice League, um, Equity Engine, um, UC Santa Barbara Seeds Program, the Distributed AI Research Network, Terrence Kiel's um, Coroner Reports um, Project, which is, I just want to say a moment about this because I think it's an, an incredibly important. Um, um, in the case of uh, Terrence Kiel's work, it's been so inspiring to see him um, uh, use this kind of deep knowledge in science, technology, and medicine to better help the public and people whose families members have been harmed uh, by through police brutality 
to um, understand things like how to read autopsy reports or the autopsy reports of their loved ones. So there are so many different kinds of ways in which science and medicine and technology converge to really do the work of um, bringing about justice and um, helping communities that are fully neglected um, in our society. And so these are the kinds of people that I think really are so deserving of partnership and support. And um, I wanna make sure that you know about them. For us at UCLA, um, our work has really been focused on um, policy. Um, we understand the incredible moment that we are living in where the potential for not only um, federal policy that would foreground and more deeply invest in public institutions and public agencies and public efforts. Of course, we think of this as being research um, uh, universities, academic libraries, um, um, uh, archives, community archives, projects that are um, profoundly tied to serving the public and um, uh, restoring in many ways the public good and expanding on the public good. But we also see an incredible need for shifting culture and communicating out to the public how important um, it is for us to not have all of the resources, our information resources live in the hands of commercial advertising platforms, which includes um, social media companies, search companies, um, other kinds of information and media companies that are truly tech companies. I mean, obviously um, these conversations around um, companies like Spotify, for example, that are really tech companies more than they are media companies are really important because the reach of knowledge and information into the public is so incredibly important that we understand. And the business logics that drive tech companies are not well understood. Um, they have really positioned themselves so powerfully as um, public goods. And um, while public goods themselves are defunded and under supported. And so we've really focused so much on the policy work and the advocacy work for public institutions, um, as well as um, the culture shifting work that we think needs to happen, which is just helping the public understand what these different kinds of technologies are. Um, the last kind of thing that I want to share is, is this kind of future work that I'm working on. And there's a preview of this work with a, in an interview I did with Ethan Zuckerman at um, UMass Amherst. Um, we're in a moment where I think um, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean that seven of the 10 most well-capitalized uh, companies on planet Earth are tech companies? That we're living in a moment where, um, for me, it's akin to, um, we're he hearing uh, uh, discourses that are akin to the discourses we heard during the era of big cotton, which was of course that the era that was predicated upon um, occupying indigenous land and also um, uh, an enslaved labor force. And um, the things we heard during that era that were written were that it would be impossible, for example, to end the slave trade and the uh, trading in African people because the American economy was, was completely reliant upon, upon it. Um, we still hear these kinds of arguments about the reliance of every industry upon the tech sector and on algorithms and artificial intelligence. And that if we don't have those kinds of technologies, we our, our economy would collapse. And of course, we've learned so much about the um, limits. What should the limits of the economic models be? Um, should they violate human and sovereign rights in order for uh, capital to flourish at all costs, including at the cost of human rights and civil rights? These are the kinds of questions that I think we are um, grappling with right now. We see more and more headlines about the ways in which AI has falsely accused uh, people, almost exclusively African-American men. We see um, over and over again headlines of facial recognition um, failing, and this again over and over again on Black women's faces um, and people of color. 
Um, so we're going to have to ask ourselves some very tough questions about what the limits of AI are. And I bring this conversation to this community because I think that what scholars and librarians and um, data scientists and information professionals do at the kind of forefront of this work is really important. And that is an incredibly important site for also putting the brakes on and saying, we don't have enough information about some of the kinds of technologies that are being used and what the implications will be. And think about, you know, we think about thousands of years of librarianship in order for us to have um, bodies of knowledge for human beings to use scientific information in particular to use to improve our qualities of life all around the world. And here we are on the precipice, I think, of employing technologies that might also um, squander those thousands of years. I mean, what does it mean, of course, at such a basic level that we digitize knowledge to the degree that if you do, don't have electricity or you don't have access to the internet, you don't have access to knowledge. I mean, that those are um, profound shifts in the way in which human beings are thinking about the future of knowledge. Um, we also are um, living in a moment um, where big tech has hired many of the lobbyists and executives from the era of big tobacco. I will tell you that my students just cannot believe that um, I try to tell them all the time that probably when I was born, my mom was chain smoking. Probably the doctor had a cigarette in his mouth when I was born. I'm sure my mom chain smoked two packs of cigarettes while she was in her hospital bed. And my students can't believe that because you know they've grown up under a different paradigm around tobacco. And so we could ask ourselves, what would it take to create a paradigm shift around big tech? What would it create to um, think about the interests of the public um, and the protections that the public needs from the kind of um, uh, self-interested uh, technology research and uh, um, projects that that are all, all around us um, that we're contending with. And this is to me an incredibly important place for librarianship. It's it's really the moment for information professionals to be at the forefront of articulating what our national and international agendas should be at the intersection of knowledge and technology, um, such that the commercial interests or the easiest or the faulty technologies do not just um, uh, move to the fore and take it for granted ways, which is really kind of what we're contending with now. So what are some things we can do? Um, I think, first of all, we can integrate the study of science and technology and AI with critical ethics studies. Um, this is really what my work has done, is brought the um, information science and library science conversations into dialogue with Black studies, with histories and theories of oppression, and really to help eliminate the stakes that live at those intersections. And I think we need more of that and, and we need uh, more uh, attention in these areas. Of course, we need to fund centers of expertise, as I've mentioned, but also hiring PhDs and researchers who come out of the humanities and social sciences who can work alongside technologists um, to teach in the sciences and engineering, but to also work in our organizations to think about the things that maybe data scientists don't always think about when they inherit a data set down at the end of the line or where they're not thinking about the data that they're using to train their machine learning algorithms, where we can kind of um, bring in other experts to help us think critically about the, that, that work. Um, I think we need um, centers of excellence that can really help shift public policy and, and culture, as I've mentioned. And of course, these are all things that we can be doing together. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, we have more data and technology than ever, but we also have more inequality to go with it and more injustice to go with it. We have this promise that AI and algorithms would liberate us. Um, but what we see is that um, when we look at the research, um, economists tell us that uh, by 2030, um, what the top 1% of wealth holders will hold two thirds of the world's wealth. We have have to ask ourselves to what degree is technology and AI implicated in more sorting between the haves and the have-nots. Um, my colleague Kathy O'Neill, who wrote the amazing book Weapons of Math Destruction, she says AI is great for helping those who are already doing great do better and those who are not doing great do worse. 
And I think there's a lot to be said about where we are using these technologies in creating more access for people who have power and privilege and less access for those who don't. And these are things that are, of course, that I get up every day and think about. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and just say thank you. And um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Noble. That was just incredible. Um, and and a, a broad swath of concerns and spaces that we've all been in. So I really appreciate it. It resonated with some. My mother, by the way, did not smoke, but I certainly babysat for lots of women who did. Um, let me start with some questions that, that will take you a little bit further into some of the interests of our, our audience. Um, an audience member says, I appreciated early in your talk that you reflect on socializing students and researchers to understand the role librarians have in information ecosystems. Do you have any strategies to share around elevating the role of librarianship and perhaps human content moderation as we continue to think about the challenges that you outlined in your talk? It's really fantastic. It's a great question. Um, you know, my colleague and close collaborator, um, Professor Sarah Roberts at UCLA, when I went, when we were in graduate school, we were actually in graduate school together and we miraculously ended up at UCLA um, uh, too. Um, when she was, you know, she did the first academic study on commercial content moderation. And uh, at the time that I was trying to argue for racist, like that, that algorithms were racist, and sexist, she was arguing that there was a hidden workforce of content moderators. And both of us, you know, those questions emanated from our commitment to librarianship and understanding librarians also as content moderators, quite frankly, um, adjudicators, people who have to um, use their kind of expertise or their uh, kind of understand things like literary warrant and other value systems to decide what is collected, what is preserved, what is not, what is purged, what is never makes it into a collection. And these are, of course, content moderation issues that um, at the in the context of global advertising companies cannot be managed. I mean, this the size and scale of the amount of content that moves into these platforms cannot be managed through software and it can't be managed through the global workforce um, at the, you know, at the speed by which content is posted. I think YouTube, um, the last interview I saw, one of their vice presidents said that they had 400, over 400 hours per minute of content being uploaded just to YouTube, 400 hours per minute just to YouTube. So at that volume, of course, we have to think about um, how much is just there. And Sarah's work has been so important in helping us understand um, what content moderators have learned about not only the decisions that they make in moderation and how that is used to train algorithms for large scale um, computing, uh, but also that, um, you know, just the lack of knowledge and depth of knowledge and the ability to even recognize racist propaganda, for example. Um, so those things are very, very important. And this is a certainly a place that where librarians, for me, I mean, our professional training is about the subjective nature of knowledge and information, and that we have different kinds of professional standards for that adjudication. Um, we are quite out front about that, which is very different than the way digital media platforms and companies argue that they are not biased, that they hold no values, that they are value free, right? So that is a fundamental tension that we have values, we know what those values are, we advocate for those values versus we have no values, we are neutral. And um, of course, part of that is because the platforms themselves do not wanna be held accountable for the kind of content that moves through their, their platforms or propaganda and they use section 230 um, to, as a shield. So I think you know part of what librarians have to do and organizations um, have to do is be out front. I mean, we also have an impulse of kind of being passive um, advocates, you know, just like I, I always feel this because um, 
Uh, I always thought, wonder, because I went to library school in the Midwest, there's such a humility um, about librarianship that is both beautiful and incredibly annoying because, you know, I'm from California and I'm like, we got to get in the streets, but we have to get in the streets. I mean, metaphorically and maybe also, um, uh, you know, actually, um, we need to be in front of policymakers, really helping them understand why it's important that they invest in public institutions, in public libraries, in universities, in academic libraries, in the funding agencies, because we are on the front line of providing high quality knowledge to the public. And if we don't take that role and take that role seriously, we will actually just leave everyone for Google or Facebook. And for me, that just seems so incredibly unsatisfying um, when we have the language of advocacy and knowledge um, at our fingertips, we really have to be activated to use it. Wow, that's very, very, uh, it, I like the, the assertiveness in that. Another question we have is going to take you into your personal process for search. And so one of the participants here is asking, can you take us through your personal process engaging in search when you'd like to learn about a particular topic to give us a framework for being more mindful as we go into search? Absolutely. It's such a great question. It really depends on what it is. So if I'm shopping, I'm looking for um, new cleats for my son, mm -hmm. I will use a search engine. I'll use something like Google because I know that it is a commercial advertising space and everybody's going to be trying to advertise the best price on cleats on, you know, on a search engine. So I'm very aware of that. If I'm trying to go deep on um, something I don't know as much about, I typically will start with a library database just to try to get a landscape analysis of what's there. Um, I also will use um, like on my phone as just a matter of like everyday needing to know things. I will often use DuckDuckGo um, because, you know, I'm just mindful of like it not tracking me right, so that I don't have a lot of influence of past searches affecting the kinds of searches that I do. I often will compare things in um, with Google too. So I often use like a variety of different kinds of methods. And then I also still ask around. I'll start. I mean, I'm fortunate because as a faculty member at UCLA, I work with thousands of experts. So I'll often also kind of like ask around, does anybody know anybody who knows anything about X, Y, or Z? Um, I'll go to our faculty pages. I'll try to see if I can um, do searching through the ucla.edu um, domain just to see if I can find like who's working on, on a thing. That's when it's more research oriented because I want to know who the people are who already know more than I know that are that I have proximity to or, you know, a warm relationship to. Uh, I also will sometimes use Google Scholar um, and I will compare that with the library databases. And I often find things that are in the databases. One last thing I wanna say though about library databases is that in the face of so many budget cuts, um, many libraries are really um, cutting back on journals, journal subscriptions. They're cutting back in a lot of different ways. We need to be advocating for more resources on the campuses. Um, and, and I say that because if you publish, let's say, um, at the intersection of race and science, and you're trying to get your work visible to other Black scholars who might also be working in this area, you might be publishing in more niche journals that Black scholars are reading and publishing in. And those tend to be journals that are first on the chopping block, that don't get bundled into big purchases that aren't owned by large publishing, scholarly publishing companies. So you have to also keep that in mind in terms of your collection development, um, how easy it is now with so much consolidation in scholarly publishing to nix access to um, underserved communities. So I'd be remiss not to say that there's, we're seeing lots of people thanking you and having enjoyed this presentation very much. And I know that your language, including collection development, is really resonating with a lot of people that are listening here right now. Um, I have um, 
uh, a third question and maybe time for one more after this, if, if I can, um, and then we'll be able to close up at four. So uh, the, the question spe is specific about librarianship. What kinds of competencies do that library and information science professionals need to have in terms of technology, AI, big data, and their intersection at, of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Thank you for asking that. When I was in the information studies department, which is our library science department at UCLA, I always taught the, the, the one diversity course. And I wish that there had been many, many more because we our students really want those classes and need those classes and um, need to think about things like the social construction of data sets, need to yeah. understand, right? How data sets come into existence. Um, and, uh, even for the kind of informaticists, they really, you know, even though they might think, oh, I didn't come here to learn about history or society, right. or that's not my thing, then they get in there and they're like, oh, ooh, ooh, oops, I didn't realize. And so those kinds of um, histories are very, very important for us to teach and to keep professionally developing and learning, even if we are not fresh out of grad school and LIS program. Um, I think that there are I, those the syllabus that I tried to share with you, and, and certainly there are a lot of people on on Twitter under the CritLib hashtag. There are a lot of critical librarians that are sharing out books and syllabi and things that people should be reading to um, really contextualize and 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 work kind of specifically in our field um, at the intersection of let's say power knowledge. Um, and oppression. And I think that there's such a wealth. I mean, I, there are people, I think of like Melissa Adler, who could give you an amazing lecture um, just about, um, or Emily Jabinski about LGBTQIA plus concerns. And of course, my gosh, no place could that be more crucial than in a conversation about science mm -hmm. and medicine, right? right? So we have a lot of work um, right here at our fingertips. Um, that we can access and that we should be touching. Well, thanks very much. Um, this is a long question. I'm going to see if maybe you could touch on it briefly before we thank you and, and thank our audience. Um, the, the questioner is saying, I was thinking about your suggestion that we hire PhDs in Black Studies into science department and in our offices to provide thoughtful lifestyle knowledge development, life cycle knowledge development. Um, having perspectives is particularly critical for rigorous and just policy development. Are there standard methods for evaluating justice and equity, particularly in policy? What are the most reliable? Folks who don't have access to scholars in-house, what would be the best options? That's a hard last question. That's a hard question. I mean, I think that we're seeing some centers emerge where we are training doctoral students who can come out. Um, certainly, we're, I've been training some students. I know Ruha Benjamin has been training undergraduates coming out. Um, uh, Andre Brock at um, Georgia Tech has been training students. I think that there are um, faculty around the country who are developing in, in, um, students to take on policy work. It's a challenge, I'll tell you, because PhD, if you if you get a PhD at a research one university, you are trained to go be a researcher at a research one university. Right. That's the project, right? The project is not to go work in public policy. In fact, that might be heavily discouraged. So I think that's a tension that's structural in academia that we're gonna have to contend with. But I will say that at the research centers that are emerging, we are, working on policy and thinking about those things and increasingly being called to testify and provide expertise. And I think that um, right now that's a small community of people, but we are there. There are great organizations, I'm thinking like Upturn and others that are doing policy work that um, at the intersection of AI, machine learning and social justice. And I would say those are also places that can be tapped for expertise. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, express my gratitude and the amount that I've learned and also so pleased to hear there's a scholar like you and your colleagues in working in the area. Let me turn back to Miriam and Mike for the final thank you and farewell. Well, I'll let Miriam take that. I'll just express my thanks as well. Yeah, we thank you so much for 
um, all of these uh, insights um, and a framework for uh, think, for introducing, I think, a bit of friction into how we go about learning about the world and taking in new information. Um, this has been a really lovely way to spend the afternoon and we're honored uh, that, that we had you with us. Um, so thank you and uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you everybody, bye-bye now.